following is a conversation with Plan C, a cryptocurrency analyst and proponent of financial freedom. Plan C is an acronym for Plan Celsius, which is a play on words inspired by the prolific Plan B or Plan Bitcoin, which introduced the stock to flow model predicting the Bitcoin price over the past decade. During our conversation, we covered many topics related to analyzing various crypto and blockchain projects, what to look for, what to be wary of, and how anyone can achieve, if not financial freedom, then at least financial success using simple indicators that are freely available to everyone. We talked about different ways to take profit and what we call the mushroom strategy, taking profit whenever a certain asset pop up in value. And when they don't simply deposit these assets to yield generating accounts like on Celsius and wait. This will make you as an investor, both disciplined and forces you to think long-term or huddle as they say in the crypto community. Overall, a great conversation with a man who against all odds found himself thriving in the crypto space and is on many levels worth listening to. My name is Mark Denker, and this is my conversation with Plan C. Thank you so much for joining me today, Plan C. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me, Mark. Um, yeah, excited to get into some topics here. There's always lots to talk about in crypto and uh, yeah, thanks for reaching out to me. I'm glad we can do this. So I came across you on uh, Twitter, like uh, many other people in crypto, I'm sure, um, where there's this infamous account called Plan B, talking about Bitcoin, uh, the stock to flow model, which uh, I think a lot of people, a lot of people trade uh, looks towards, which we can get into what the stock to flow model actually means. But then uh, when I started following Plan B, I quickly came across your account, Plan C. And being a uh, Celsius fanboy, uh, I think uh, it was obvious to me that uh, Plan C might even be more powerful than Plan B. But uh, maybe you can tell us from the, from the horse's mouth, uh, what's the difference between Plan B and Plan C for Plan C himself? Yeah, for sure. No, it's it's funny. I don't know. I like. I'm trying to remember even how I decided to have that name. But yeah, I just one day clicked or something. But um, it's. I'm glad you found me somewhat on the journey through Plan B because there's a lot of people to follow him. So if uh, yeah, that's a good good path to association. But um, yeah, no, I would say like uh, the different like it just for me anyways. Like yeah, this C was a little bit of a play on Celsius because um, once I found Celsius, I really started to dive into it and. I started to like a lot of uh, a lot of things clicked for me and uh, how big this project could be and I actually yeah I made my account uh, at the time it was uh, one trillion cell um, you know plan plan B has his account I think it's like one hundred trillion USD or something so I, I jokingly mm. put one tr uh, one uh, trillion cell mm. but um, you know there's there's more behind that I I do believe Celsius the company can be a behemoth like I do think that it can be a, a, a really significant uh, company over the long term and and who knows where it mark, its market cap could be one day mm -hmm. um and yeah so that was part of that but um i would say like the, the different plans i guess you could uh you could go through i could go through like um plan a i guess is what a, most of the people are in whatever 90 plus percent of the population is still on plan a which to me would be just holding you know um government fiat like just holding fiat in in the banks mm -hmm. and and earning essentially no interest and in some place in the world, even, even a, a negative interest rate potentially. But yeah, that would be plan A, right? You're just, um, you're, in, you're in mostly cash and maybe you're mm. holding some stocks or whatever, like the traditional model. Uh, plan B would be, like you talked about, like the um, plan B would be more, I guess, what the traditional idea would be, just like holding Bitcoin, you know, uh, custing your own, your own wallets. And um, yeah, you're not earning any interest and you're, you're basically not your keys, not your coins kind of idea where you might just hold Bitcoin. Mm. You know, you're not, you're not earning that yield though. Uh, for me, plan C, like I mean, plan B is still very popular and it's still a, a good way to go. But um, plan C for me is more about um, taking advantage of everything, right? Looking at, okay, you know, it's not just maybe this, maybe this uh, market is not just about Bitcoin. You know, th there are probably some other opportunities here. So what I, what I've done myself is I've, I've looked at a lot of um, hedge funds, uh, that are crypto head funds focused. And I've kind of said, okay, what are they looking at as the major thesis is like the macro thesis is for crypto. And, and I've, and I've seen kind of what they've identified. And then I, I kind of myself thought about it quite a bit. 
And mm. yeah, looking at the, the kind of open finance uh, category or the thesis of open finance, which encompasses a lot. And then you have your Web3 you know, vision or whatever you call it, where you, know, you have this platform that's probably going to be very significant. Uh, that a lot of things are going to get built on top of. Mm. Um, and then you have your, your state-free store of value, um, which Bitcoin is, in my opinion, you know, already kind of won that category, most likely. Um, ETH is probably the only competitor at the t- uh, currently, I believe. Mm. Um, so you have different major theses. So for me, like plan C would be identifying the, the overall trends and the overall category leaders, um, and then and then uh, putting those somewhere where you can earn a yield also. So you're you're not only trying to f- trying to be a little bit more like you're not only trying to diversify slightly where you're not just betting on only Bitcoin. You're kind of looking at okay, what are the potential other huge opportunities? Identifying those and then looking where you can safely earn a yield. And for me, Celsius is the safest place still um, I've identified where you can earn a meaningful yield on a variety of coins. And, and they do also um, somewhat filter out uh, a lot of the scams. Like they, they're very selective on what they put on the platform. It's usually it's only yeah. coins or it's only coins they can earn a yield on. Right. So because of that, it does filter out a lot um, because it's gotta be coins that have like an institutional demand or have a way of earning mm-hmm. yield. So, and um yeah, and also they do a lot of auditing of the code, and so there's a there's a level of uh, filtering mm-hmm. there where we can be a little more confident. It doesn't mean everything on the the app of Celsius is a good investment. It just means that you're less likely to get a, a scam or a rug pull or something happen. You know, so yeah, there's lots of uh, there's a range of of interest rates on Celsius, um, but for me, Plan C is about earning a yield, earning that passive income, compounding your interest. And on top of that, you're getting the growth of the assets at the same time. So it's kind of like the best of everything you could say. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, anyways, that's it's a long answer, but that's kind of the the uh, reason behind Plan C. It's a it's a play on Celsius, but it's also a play on that kind of uh, uh, earning a yield on apps, assets at the same time as getting the upside. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, it's pretty. That's actually a point about Celsius, a, a benefit of Celsius that is not much talked about. That like they work as a filter, as a screening layer from all these crazy crypto projects that pop up everywhere, take it from someone who's been liquidity mining for quite some time. And sometimes you see on these different uh, DEXs and AMMs, you see these insane rewards that they promise only to get rock pulled in a month or two. Um, it's I call it a, an advanced form of Ponzi scheme uh, where the people at the top who started out, typically uh, a, a new cryptocurrency that promises all these different rewards you know it's only going to take a month or two until it tanks in price and then you end up holding the bag you won't experience that when you use celsius like they have screened the project they can they stand behind these projects that you as a user of the celsius app and now web app also uh, are able to deposit coins too so that, yeah, that's you, actually yeah yeah no it's it's something where like you yeah, you're not guaranteed like you choose any of the investments on the app, like they're going to do well, like lots of them couldn't like or might not do well. But um, but you at least, you know, like there's a, a really high probability. Yeah, like you said, you're not going to get like straight up scammed, which I mean, mm-hmm. if you look at the overall crypto space, like you said, it's uh, it's a bit of a minefield, right? You have like, I don't know, upwards of 11,000 cryptos. I know those are just like the ones on CoinMarketCap and and a lot of those are obviously not serious, serious uh, even uh, investments, but um, still, even in the even in the top thousand or top five hundred or whatever you want to look at, there's yeah. there's a ton that um, yeah are just they're just kind of borderline scams and mm-hmm. even some of the even some of the higher caps are in my opinion can be borderline scams um, mm-hmm. <laughs> such as an EOS. But yeah, uh, <laughs> we can get into yeah. that later. Before yeah, uh, for, sure. for people for perspective for people, we talked offline about EOS uh, yeah. a little bit, but uh, we can we can get back to that in a minute. Uh, yeah, for but sure, maybe. Exactly. On the Celsius part, let's say you're someone, you first hear about Celsius in this uh, video or podcast or whatever people use uh, to uh, to hear this. You, uh, you're just starting out with Celsius today uh, or maybe tomorrow if you just hear about this. What would you be doing if you were that person? How would you get started with Celsius? Yeah, for sure. In, in what way, just as a, like as a general investor, like as somebody who, what, what would be my focus or like me and yeah. myself personally, you talking about me, me personally or? 
No, so let's say I, I have a plan A right now. I uh, work at my daily job. I make a salary. I save a little bit of money every month. That money goes into my bank account where I get, if not zero uh, yield, then negative yield on my cash in US dollars, let's say, for simplicity. So if I'm a type A or plan A kind of person and I'm interested, I'm curious to uh, get into the whole plan C uh, Celsius game, what would you be doing as a person like that? Yeah, I mean, if it's someone who didn't have, like, uh, hasn't looked into crypto at all or, or doesn't have, um, yeah, just hasn't been in the space, they're brand new. Mm. I mean, it depends on their risk tolerance and, and their situation, of course. But like, I mean, it's not a bad option just to start with stable coins and put stable coins on the app and, and just learn. And, and uh, you know, once you feel more comfortable, then, you know, venture out from there into different options. Probably you'd want to start with the, the big, you know, the, the, um, the blue chips like Bitcoin, Ethereum. So, yeah, I would say for someone like completely brand new to um, mm. more just like survey the landscape of crypto. And in the meantime, you might as well like... What I would what I would explain to somebody is is how stable coins are, um, in a lot of ways, less risky than holding your dollars in a bank, right? Mm. And just the the fact that depending on what um, stable coin you're holding, like USDC is the one I choose, but um, there's also I think Paxos is it Paxos mm. that has a they have a they have a stable coin as well, yeah, Pax. Celsius and yeah. Pax, yeah, Pax, that's the, yeah, and they um their 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 reserve ratios and and what they what they are using to back that uh, stable coin is um is a is a very high standard they might not have the awareness in the marketplace as far as um most people have heard of like uh, tether and usdc uh, dc mm -hmm. those are the most popular but there are other options that are very secure so the point being like some of these stable coins you know the actual what's backing them is is actually less risky um mm -hmm. and less leveraged uh and and have higher higher quality like a, a u.s treasury um, or different different things that um, so I would explain to people like what what stable coins actually represent what's backing them, and mm -hmm. then I would probably say like yeah just start with that and and you're getting a good yield on that. Um, you know I would probably tell them the whole other things, but but right. uh, but I think starting out like the safest and and kind of best way to go because you know I look at what I, what I did when I got into crypto I got in at the peak of 2017, um, mm -hmm. which and the thing about crypto or any kind of market cycle is most people they're going to get interested close to a top because that's when all their friends mm -hmm. and, and people they know are talking about it, right? If we just think about, we just had a huge influx of people come in mm -hmm. and uh, I can talk about why, like a lot of them bought in like between 40 and, and 65 K right. Mm -hmm. um, on this run up. And cause that's just what happens. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. uh, everyone thinks, Oh, I can get into this. I can make money right away. So mm -hmm. the tendency in a cycle is for people to new people to come in, at the wrong times in the cycle and so it's it's good um to start out with stable coins i would say and then yeah. you earn that yield with celsius kind of like take some time to educate yourself on the overall space you know maybe start with the the larger caps like stick mm. with like whatever the top 50 or top 20 stick with a bitcoin or an ethereum mm. stuff that's more proven and safer and then maybe from there like venture out into to what people see as other opportunities um but yeah it, it would be a different answer if uh I can't give financial advice to anyone, of course, but it'd be a different answer if someone said like, what would I do today um, right. starting out? Because with the understanding I have in the last four years, I would be right. making certain decisions, right? But that's right. Yeah. But if you're just getting into keeping crypto. Keeping a general, um, keeping a general yeah, I think, yeah. stable coin approach to start with and yeah. Yeah, get comfortable yeah. with using Celsius, the app or another platform that is is of high quality and and kind of go from there because you're, you're earning that yield. And then with that yield, you can you can decide, okay, with this yield, Maybe I'll use the the interest to start mm -hmm. to to dabble in other coins or, yeah. or um, yeah, go from there, right? Yeah, and I mean it's easy to understand also a stablecoin. Of course, you need to look into the different stablecoins because there are many. Um, but uh, once you wrap your head around that concept, it's pretty straightforward, right? One dollar equals one USDC, for example. Is that what you, if that's what you use? And the benefit, just to for perspective for the for the. Uh, viewer uh, or listener today um i mean if you get zero percent in your bank account and celsius i'm, I'm on their website right now so this gives you 8.88 percent the economic benefit is pretty obvious right you might pay some onboarding fees going from fiat us dollars to a stable coin like usdc so it might be two three four percent even uh, depending on where you are uh, from but even then uh, you will make a return after maximum six months uh, and after that it's just pure profit right um i heard recently that 
Celsius is also coming out with their swap feature. I think it's soon uh, in August, I heard. Uh, don't hold me up against that. But uh, when you can do that, I mean, once you're in uh, Celsius or equivalent, when you have stable coins, it's easy to just swap from USDC, for example, to Bitcoin, let's say, uh, once you're more comfortable uh, in, the, in the new and exciting crypto space. Yeah, exactly. Like you're well positioned, right? Because then you're you're in a, yeah, you're in a place like you said with Celsius um, or another. There's other good options, but like yeah, with mm -hmm. Celsius with the in-app swaps, I mean, it does put you in a good position because you can you're in the you're in the uh, the app there. You have your stable coins. You're learning about the different uh, opportunities, and then you say you have a drop in the in the market or, or whatever along along the cycle. Then you just quit, you know, you just spread in the app. You can you can uh, decide what percentage you want to put into uh, something besides the stable coins. So yeah, you're you're in a position where you can take advantage of drops, and um, and over time you can kind of keep an eye out. Like what I, what I would say would be a good place for someone to be is like educating themselves about the market. Like you said, earning that yield, mm -hmm. and then and then be eyeballing specific investments they've targeted, and then looking for opportunities to get into the to the cycle and, and waiting for a correction. We're gonna have them. Like uh, the thing about crypto is it's volatile. Mm -hmm. It gives you opportunities to get in, and sure. um, you know, there's, there's always, like, it's, it's still very early, uh, I believe mm -hmm. in the overall like adoption curve of crypto. So, mm -hmm. I mean, and I think the tendency for people getting in when they find out about it is like, you get excited. I mean, I know I did, you get excited. You want to jump right in, like right in the deep end right away. You want to, you feel like you missed, like no matter where, when people get in, they feel like mm -hmm. they're late or they feel missed like it. they're m missed out. And there's yeah. people that have been here before. It's like you show up late to a party, right? You want to you go around and figure out what's going on and you meet people. And so it, it, it's um, something where if you realize that mm -hmm. even people getting in like today, like it's, you're still, you're still an early adopter, I believe. Like, and so um, I think just being patient and, and not necessarily like, yeah, just getting too excited right away. Um, it, it can go, you know, you can, it, it, the result, you can get good results in a way, in a way, no matter what you do, if you're, mm -hmm. if you hold long enough, but, but mm -hmm. it's still, I think it's a less emotionally painful uh, approach to, to be a bit more conservative out of the gate. Um, mm -hmm. I went the opposite route. I ended up, you know, jumping right in and, and mm -hmm. I went through a, a learning curve in a lot of ways through the bear market and just held and, and kind of, yeah. So it, it can, uh, you can get education in different ways. Like sometimes mm -hmm. education is just like being down in a position and having to research to, to figure out what you're holding. I think, uh, yeah. So a lot of people think they're, you know, when the prices are all going up, everyone's brilliant and, and people tend to maybe mm -hmm. do less research. And when the market's going down, people are like, okay, what am I actually holding here? Let me look into this. Should I keep holding this? So um, yeah, it's just the way the market teaches, teaches us, I guess, but. Yeah, yeah and, and I think we let's talk about the market. I mean, it's been going up and down. But before we do, just to uh, bring it home in terms of how early we still are, I mean, uh, and, and I think you are completely right. Uh, everybody feels like they're late uh, to the party, even though they turned up early to the party. But Celsius, they have a, um, a target or a goal of getting the next 100 million users, I believe, into crypto. That's sort of their official goal. And they have less than 1 million uh, users at this point, from what I remember, at least. You can actually see it in the app. It's very transparent. So they're less than a percent, uh, you know, they finish less than a percent of their goal. And uh, then if you look at the active wallets, people who are actively using Celsius, I think they define it as having a certain position over, is it $500 or whatever, uh, then it's less than a quarter of a million, like two, is it 200,000 yeah, or 300,000? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. It's, it's um, I, I believe uh, last time I was told anyways, I believe the, the barrier for the active wallets is like $10 or more. It could be yeah. 10 or $20. Right. I can't remember, but it's one, it's a, it's um, yeah. One of those. And then yeah, no. I think they have at the moment. Um, yeah. They have over 300,000 active mm -hmm. users. Right. Um, but there's also like corporate, uh, I'm not sure exactly the full breakdown, but there are some corporate accounts that, um, right. and, and different ways that, um, stuff is fed in through their APIs. So there's, yeah, potentially more than that, but at least 300, 300,000 active wallets and getting right. close to a million, I think it's over 850,000, uh, total signups. So like KYC individuals that nece haven't necessarily deposited anything, but they're fully KYC on the app and like they mm -hmm. could at any point. Right. So they're considered, right um depends how you define things but yeah they they're like you said the point being it's less than one percent of their goal exactly. and exactly. um and i think like their goals are are achievable and and um 
yeah, given the project, like uh, I think they will onboard a, a, a significant amount of, of users into crypto um, just because yield is the killer app. Like one of the, one of the killer apps I see is a long-term uh, killer app for sure. Definitely. But uh, yeah, so for anyone who feels like they are late to the party, I th I think that's completely wrong and the wrong way of thinking about it. You are at the perfect time uh, to join the party. Uh, Celsius is less than 1%, less than half a percent if you look at the active wallets uh, to, to their goal. So um, so yeah, a uh, good time to jump in. Um, and speaking of the market and jumping in, maybe don't jump in today because today has been a crazy day. Uh, Many cryptos are up 10, 15, 20%. Um, Bitcoin jumped from, what was it, like 32,000 to almost 40,000 today. Um, so it's been going up and down a lot these past days. And it seems like we are slowly but surely moving out of a potential bear trap into a new bull market or second stage of the bull market, if you will. But uh, what do you what do you see in the market going? You you look at the data on a daily basis. It seems like you know much more about this. So, so what's yeah, your like takeaway? I, for sure, yeah. I use a, a primarily Glassnode. I look at other other sites and other other places as well. But Glassnode is, I believe, the leader in the space as far as the most amount of um, indicators and and on chain data. And, and they, yeah, I just like the way they lay things out. Um, so yeah, I would say like couple things like well yeah we this um this fast move up you know was a short squeeze as far as my mm. understanding um mm. yeah there was i think seven uh, lot, when i was checking yesterday there was um uh, at one point there was uh, basically three quarters of a billion uh dollars of of short liquidations on bitcoin and about a hundred um a hundred million short liquidations on ethereum in a four-hour span um, so once we were having like a pretty, once the, what was causing that that large move up, there was a lot of short li uh, liquidations. So yeah, that can happen, right? You get a short squeeze and um, there was a lot of kind of, uh, I guess, yeah, in the, in the overall market, it was kind of, it was, it could have gone either way. Like the, the price was sitting like close to that uh, uh, 30 to $35,000 level for quite mm -hmm. a long time. Volatility, volatility was actually slowing down. Um there's a lot of people calling for for lower levels, twenty thousand and, and things like that. Um, the interesting thing when you look at the on-chain data is um, they can actually see they can look at all the Bitcoin and when they were purchased and the volumes at different price levels. And so, um, yeah, with that metric, you're able to see okay what percentage of the supply has moved on-chain at different uh, price levels. So it's kind of like the cost mm. basis of the entire network of Bitcoin. And it's it's a really unique thing because you know people look at TA and TA has TA also has a lot of value, um, and it's just a different way of looking at uh, you could say TA because you're seeing uh, where the the because people psychologically like a big thing with um, human psychology is, and this this goes towards like um, resistant levels and 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 support levels is people don't like to sell at a loss. It's kind of goes against our human nature. Like people mm. tend to at least want to sell break even or at some level of profit. And that's just like a human psychological aspect. So um, with this on-chain uh, metric where you can see the volume at different price levels, what you see is you see a different form of, uh, you could say like that TA uh, support and resistance. Um, and and what, we, what I noticed uh, on-chain was there was actually a huge percentage of the supply that had moved between 31 and 34,000. So we had actually 10% of, of the whole circulating supply that it moved in that in that uh, that band, and so yeah, that band has a lot of uh, support and resistance. I guess potential resistance if we were to drop down to twenty k. Um, mm. But these are new entries. Like these are people that have only really come in. A lot of these have only come in, in the last six months, right. um, which makes sense because that's where the price has been. <laughs> but like maybe even right. the last three three months, or even even the last really the last month. I guess I would say actually the, mostly the last month mm. or the last two for sure. So um, yeah, because of that. You know these people. Even if we were to go down to twenty thousand, um, these people would potentially just hold on the way up. So yeah, the, up, the resistance on the way up might not be that significant. Um, we do also have a lot of clustering of volume uh, buying in the in the like fifty five uh, to sixty k range, or like fifty to sixty k range. So mm. because a lot of people got in here at the top, right? There was there was high right. volume and high excitement at those levels. So those people, a lot of them um, have sold, and a lot of them are still holding, right? So mm. I could, you know, it is possible we see more resistance to do with this metric once we get up to those levels. I don't see, right. yeah, like there's pretty smooth sailing um, as far as the on-chain volume at different price levels up until we kind of get closer to the all-time high. 
Right. Um, so yeah, that's just, it's just one one uh, one indicator, one metric, or uh, or one I guess one on chain data point is to see, you know, cost basis of the network. When are people buying, mm-hmm. and um, how do I how am I compared to that, and and what what could that mean? So mm-hmm. we saw. So one thing we did see for sure is we saw a capitulation at um, there was two different levels of main capitulation. So once we kind of dropped down from the all time high, which I guess was um, April fourteenth. I thought it was interesting how, if you look at the 2013 cycle, we actually had our first peak of that two peak cycle, April, uh, it was April 10th or April 9th. Um, and then this time was April 14th, just a funny coincidence that hmm. it happened to be the same time of the year. Um, hmm. So I just thought it was kind of interesting, but uh, there's a lot of, a lot of parallels to that 2013 cycle. And, and I don't believe history repeats, but it, you know, I do think there's some rhyming and, and some patterns that you can find. Uh, there are a lot mm. of things that are very different about this market cycle, but there are some, some uh, you could say some things that do compare to that uh, double peak cycle. But um, yeah, so we had, uh, after we hit that peak, uh, April 14th, um, you know, coming down with the price there, like we had a huge amount of uh, realized losses. So a realized loss on chain, what that means is, is basically people are selling at a loss. Like there, so there's unrealized losses, which is just paper losses where people mm. are holding uh, they're underwater, but they're not actually sell. They haven't actually sold their position. Mm. But what we saw is we saw um, on uh, yeah we saw like four and a half billion in actual realized losses on a single day. This was uh, when we came down from sixty four k down to th- uh, on the way down to where we are. We we went through like at thirty seven thousand. There was four and a half billion dollars of of people. I look at it as a capitulation event. So mm. on a single day. If you, if you look at the on-chain data there, it shows the candles for each day and, and how many uh, people are realizing losses. And on that day, it was like a, an absurd, like I think it was like three or four times the average on a single day. Like every single day, there's people selling at a loss. Every single day, there's people selling at profits, right? Mm. But this day was like abnormally high. So it was a, oh. more of a capitulation. And then um, the next day, we had another 3 billion of, of capitulation of, of sellers. And then on uh, that was on May 20th and, and May 19th. And then on, on June 25th, um, basically a month later, we saw another a capitulation event where we saw 3.8 billion on a single day at 31,000. So we had kind of like capitulation on the way down at 37 and then a massive capitulation at 31. And so the point of saying all that is when I was looking at the on-chain data, I was like, wow, we've, we've already seen a lot of people that have sold at a loss. And we've already seen a lot of these weak hands being shaken out. And mm. I saw this, this, uh, daily realized selling at a loss drying up over the last like um since we had a second capitulation event over the last um i guess you could say month yeah it was basically a month exactly the average uh, daily realized losses has been around 400,000 or 400 not 400,000 400 million so you can see the difference right you had you had days where we were talking like four and a half like 4 billion in a single day and mm. since then since those events um it's just interesting how everyone kind of sells at the same time. But since since those events, we've actually mm. only been averaging for the last thirty days, um, a forty or four hundred million. And it's been downtrending. So right. to me, that basically indicates that the weak hands have been shaken out of the market. Mm. Um, and then on the flip side, you can also look at uh, realized um, profits, and that's to do with yeah, profit taking on chain. So that's kind of like the people that got in at lower levels. You know, they were selling on the way up, and they and and how. It's the other side of the coin, right? Because people can sell for two reasons: they can sell because they want to take profits, or they can sell because they're, you know, they're tired of the tired of being underwater, and they, or mm. whatever reason, they want out of the market. Um, so on the on the flip side, with the realized uh, profits, uh, what I also saw on chain was um, pretty much the profit taking had been finished. So over the last few weeks here, I was watching it, and I was seeing that um, there was people that were taking huge amounts of profits on the way up. We had a day where there was five billion dollars of uh, realized profits on chain. And yeah. um, you can actually see with these candles when the uh, the smart money you could say or the the um, people that got in at earlier levels um, uh, they're more they're uh, they're kind of dollar cost averaging out when they feel like the market's mm-hmm. overheated. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we saw that. The point is that um, with both realized profits and realized losses, I saw the dwindling of that and the downtrending, and it showed me that the profit takers had ha- already taken their profits uh, over the last few months. And then the uh, the capitulate capitulating or the weak hands, whatever you want to call it, they also had kind of become exhausted, and so mm. we really didn't have a lot of sellers left, um, kind of around the thirty k level. Um, mm. We also had like, of course, the stuff going on with China, so you had some miners that were having to sell um, 
uh, during their move from out of China. Right. So yeah, I, I don't want to, I, I can, I can just, I'll just keep talking. So I should let you, let you talk because I'm just, I'll just keep going. Mm-hmm. I, I could, I could talk about a lot of other factors, but yeah, if there's anything else you want to say, like to direct my, my rambling here. No, I think, uh, I mean, what I take away here is two very, very powerful lessons. And if you follow them, uh, there's a lot of profit to be made. One is huddle through the storm, right? Deposit your crypto to something like Celsius or whatever, generates yields, and you sleep well at night. You don't need to think about the price, you just huddle. And then when the market starts to explode, because we've seen over and over again, especially in crypto, how the market, you know, it goes down a lot and then it goes up a lot. And then make sure you take profit, a little profit at least, uh, along the way up. Uh, so you sort of safeguard yourself from these massive drops that will follow at some points. We've seen it over and over again. The trend is pretty clear upwards, but it's very volatile <laughs> on that trend line. And if you huddle and take profit on the way up, that profit you can use for different things, right? Some people, they use it for consumption, buying something nice for themselves. Some people even go out and buy houses, cars, whatever. There's a big joke about that in crypto, buying Lambos. But other people, and that's where I think the real smart money is, is they take profit on the way up, store it again on something like Celsius, generate some yield. And when the market tanks, dips, as we like to say, then they buy up again. Um, I think that's where the real smart money goes. But maybe you have a comment on that also, of course. Well, no, I agree with that. Like, And, and I think it's it's just, it's yeah, I mean, the, the reality is that... Um, so, like a good percentage of people, I think, understand the concept of it, but in practice, it's it's it goes Hard. against human human emotion, right? And, yeah. and I think the discipline uh, nature of of uh, yeah, I think it's important for people, any investor. It's important to understand kind of your tendencies and your personality type. Um, I think this mm-hmm. is like actually an underrated uh, aspect of investing. Um, mm-hmm. I came across some information uh, where they did some research on the sixteen different personality types. Like there's a million different you know types of of uh, yeah, ways of looking at personality types, but there was, they, they looked at the Myers-Briggs personalities, the 16 types, and they actually uh, looked at, um, through this research, they looked at, okay, which personality types tend to do the best with investing in, and with the market. Hmm. And they determined um, that there are, it's a massive difference, like a statistically uh, a significant difference between personality types with investing. And so when you understand your personality, um, I mean, the, the biggest thing they've really found, which know when you when you hear it it makes complete sense like uh, mm. people that are emotional like personality types that tend to be more emotional basically mm. give their money to people that are less emotional um mm. for personality types that tend to be more logical and, and tend to be more patient versus ones that are less patient so you you pretty much have like with markets money moving from people that are less patient to people that are patient and people from people that are emotional to people that are less emotional. Mm. I mean, a very, very simplistic way of looking at it, but that is kind of the way I see markets because it is a net a zero sum game um, in a mature market, I guess you could say in a, in a market that's growing. Yeah. There's new money coming in and, and, you know, you can kind of um, yeah, everyone can make money, I guess in a way, because you have such a, a growth of a, of a sector, but uh, right. But in general, like, um, yeah, I think understanding your personality and if you do tend to be mm-hmm. someone who's more emotional, um, then just being aware of that and, and looking and, and for me, like, I don't like to, um, I tend to, my personality type is to be more logical and, and be more numbers uh, oriented. Mm-hmm. But for me, like, on, even though I'm already have that tendency, I actually um, just, I double down on it. And I, and I really focus on looking at uh, hard data and, and because mm-hmm. I, I don't want to be an emotional investor. Um, and I just, I want to have, I feel more confident and I feel uh, just, yeah, I just feel better as an investor to, to, um, cause I, cause with crypto, especially like there's so many headlines and there's so many things like that. that it's funny because yeah, we have that, mm-hmm. that meme or that thing that came like the FUD or the fear, uncertainty and doubt, like that whole mm-hmm. concept um, came to crypto because, you know, there is, there is a level of manipulation um, mm. um, uh, to whatever degree people can decide their, to themselves, but there's headlines and there's things that don't always check out. And, and it's hard to, if you're just looking at headlines and if you're just like, because everyone looks at headlines, right? So if you're mm. looking at the same information that everyone else is, yeah. you're most likely going to do what everyone else does. <laughs> so yeah, it's exactly. like, but you, you got to be looking at stuff that's beyond, I would say, just the headlines because, um, a lot of times, yeah, things, things in headlines, there's alternative motives and yeah, we can, yeah, pretty sure. much. So, 
And I mean, I um, I have this. I don't know if I'm becoming famous for this uh, theory, this strategy, but I use the I call it the mushroom strategy. It's obviously going the route of like you looking at the data and then really spending time on educating yourself. But I think a lot of people they don't want to or they don't have the skills to be able to digest all that data. And that's why I, and that includes myself. I, I have the educational background. I'm an economist by education, but I just don't feel like I have the time to, to crunch through all that data. And then it changes so fast in general. So I use what I call the mushroom strategy, which, which is basically you, you have a certain portfolio of crypto currencies. You put it into something like uh, Celsius earning yield. And every time something pops up in price, that's where the mushroom come, uh, come pops up in your farm. Then you take off your yield. So basically, let's say you earned uh, over the course of two months, you've earned uh, whatever, 2% in yield or 1% or whatever. But because the price spikes so much, it's actually a substantial amount of money, depending on how much you deposit, of course. So you take out that profit, turn it into stable coins, or maybe something, uh, another cryptocurrency that has been underperforming that you still believe in. Uh, and in that way, you sort of build up your portfolio slowly but surely, cutting down those mushrooms every time they pop up. And a day like this, for example, today when the crypto has been going up a lot, uh, I've been taking profit on, I think, three different coins uh, today and uh, converting it into, uh, into stable coins. And then what I hope for uh, is that the market drops a little bit uh, tomorrow or in two days or whatever, and then I will buy up um, uh, something else. The risk on, of that strategy is obviously that the, the market will continue going up. And then I sold, <laughs> I, I took profit too early, basically. So that's that's the risk that I'm willing to take. That's okay with me because I didn't sell any of my principal. I only took, that's the important point, right? I only took the uh, profit that I made uh, using something like Celsius. Yeah, actually, I really like that. Um, for a lot of reasons, I really like that. It's um, it's it's a discipline. It's it's uh, it's um. Anytime you have like a, a strategy, you stick with it, then mm. you you have something that, yeah, to me, it's a, it's a feedback loop. So you can say, okay, how is this, how is this performing? And, and, mm. and I think something like that, like you're really um, reducing your downside uh, risk in a lot of ways. And you're forcing mm. yourself to be, you're basically forcing yourself to be disciplined. And I think that's a really good exactly. approach. And you're not taking like crazy amounts of profits, but you're taking some. And, and right. by doing that, you're positioning yourself where, uh, most people, if they don't take any profits and they're just waiting, you know, the entire cycle, um, they have to hodl because they have yeah. to go through these ups and downs. Whereas if you're doing your strategy and that kind of an approach, um, you almost don't care where the market goes in the short term, uh, okay. because if it goes down a bit, you know, you take advantage of that. If it keeps going up, okay, well, I, I didn't, I didn't get max, um, maybe upside, but mm -hmm. I also um, locked in profits and and emotionally, I mean, I'm sure you. I don't, I don't know your situation, but I, I'm assuming that you're uh, probably less stressed than than most of the market. So uh, right. I think it's a great I think it's a great strategy. I think it uh, makes a lot of sense, and I and I think it's um, and and that's the thing too, right? With the the way the price moves, there's such volatility, and there's such fast movements to the upside that, like you said, that interest, even though it might be over a few months span, um, like a percent or two. It, it can be a lot more than that, right? Like if you have mm -hmm. a, a doubling or tripling of whatever asset you're in, I mean, sure. that becomes easily, you know, that can become 6% over a few months uh, or mm -hmm. whatever, four, four, six percent so, so yeah, and you take a good percentage of profits, you're ready for any downside. And then you also still have the vast majority in for the upside. So I think it's great, a great way to do things for sure. That's that's why I like to advocate for it and, and, and share it with people because the mental uh, stress of uh, using the so-called quote unquote mushroom strategy that I just outlined, it, it gives you calm when the market tanks because at least you took profit when before the market tanked. And you feel like, yeah, I'm, you know, my principal and my portfolio is down a lot, but at least I took some profit. So I'm not completely stupid or whatever you might think of yourself when, when that happens. And if the market continues to go up, then I'm like, yeah, okay. I took profit too early, but still my principal is, is worth way more. So I'm still winning. Uh, so I think, yeah, both the mental stress and of course the economic benefit is, uh, it's pretty good. It's been treating me well, at least, uh, over, yeah. over. I think it's, it's good for whoever, like whatever type of investor, just to have 
something, some sort of methodology or something they're following to, um, mm. yeah, just have a strategy. I think we're, regardless of what your strategy is, like um, have something I would say, or and have a plan, like at least a plan, a, a strategy and a plan. Um, otherwise, you know, just winging things, it, it tends to be harder. Um, make more mistakes potentially right um, exactly. everyone can always get lucky but like on average like probability wise like you're most likely um yeah not gonna stick fare to as plan. well yeah. stick, to, stick to a plan right plan a make up your own plan right so um rule number always, one stick to plan always <laughs> stick to a plan right again <laughs> and um so uh, one question about your, your strategy there are you or do you have a threshold for what percentage of a, a increase mm. in the in the price before mm. you do take those those profits or how do you yeah. do, do you just do it based on a monthly basis like no matter what the yeah. um like how do you how do you structure it yeah so um that's a million dollar question and i've actually been back and forth between uh, between a lot of things uh, on on that part uh, when to uh, to cash out uh, or take profit so I, I use different, um, I use, for example, uh, TradingView, uh, which many people might know, where I have all the cryptocurrencies uh, that I follow. And in that, you can set different uh, indicators. There's something called RSI, uh, which indicates whether a uh, particular asset is overbought or oversold. There's boiling up bands. There's different indicators that tells you whether the market is overheated or the opposite, of course. And I just set these different bands, especially, um, and when a, a certain asset or crypto is uh, trading a, a way beyond a um, a moving average uh, or exponential moving average, to be correct, uh, then I cash out uh, or take some profit there uh, when it's uh, being over overbought, basically. Uh, so yeah, that's my way of doing it. So I just look every morning. I just see just because I'm curious also what's happening in blockchain and crypto in general. So I can't stop. And it's, it's quite easy to see, okay, there's some, there's a crypto, uh, there's a coin that has been increasing like 20% today. It's probably a good place to start, whether it's being overbought. And then I can see, okay, it's over the trend line, uh, long-term trend line. I'll go in and take profits. So that's the easy way, I think, of doing it once you know how to set up on, uh, on trading view. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> so you're using like yeah, using like the kind of traditional TA indicators exactly. um, as a way of of kind of increasing the probability of your kind of like knowing okay, this is an oversold point potentially, and then that gives you kind of like a, a way of determining when to do your strategy. So yeah, I think that's you're combining kind of two things, but that's um, yeah. overall that makes sense for sure. A, a similar 100%. way of doing it would just be, I have a target for if I bought Bitcoin, I bought it let's say at thirty k. And my target is to make 10% profit. So that will be 33K. Uh, and whenever the price hits 33K, then I take out profit. That could be a simple strategy also if you don't want to get into trading view and all these different uh, indicators um, for sure. Yeah. But I have no, a question that, yeah, to, sure. to throw back to you, uh, Plan C, um, because a lot of people is talking about right now that we are getting into the next phase of the bull market, a bull run. And I think a lot of people is right now at least uh, in this moment thinking about whether to double down and then you know hit the the next uh, wave of the bull run or to cash out because we've been uh, we've been going up a lot the, the past few days so what do you see do you see a, a second uh, run uh, coming up or yeah where do you see the market going from here basically yeah yeah for sure definitely not financial advice i would i would say for myself mm -hmm. like i'm my my uh, focus is on long term i'm not um, someone who I, although there are things on on chain and different indicators you can look at for short term um, i don't i don't focus i don't tend to focus on that so i'm not really uh, super confident in like any kind of short term uh, predictions or anything like that but but i do feel like this uh, my overall feeling is um from looking at all, all the data is the this bull run is far from over this market cycle is far from over and mm. I, I could go into a million reasons why um mm. a couple of very basic reasons is you can really see so in any market cycle um, what you have is you have older wallets so there's something called hodl waves mm. and what hodl waves are is they can actually the cool thing about um, blockchain is you have all these insights with the on-chain data that you just don't get in a, in a lot of other systems. So True. what you're able to see is they um, they can cluster uh, wallets and they can see okay uh, what percentage of wallets have held their Bitcoin for or not not sorry not wallets actual Bitcoin. So they can determine mm. um, how many Bitcoin were purchased and have been held over a year. 
how many have been held. Like there's different levels, right? You have a year, you have two years, you have five years, seven years, you have six months, you have, you have kind of like a range between like three to six months and then between one to three months. So they kind of have these, these different points with these hollow waves and what is the overall um, point of the, the whole, uh, that whole indicator what it's, it's, it's determining is, okay, where's the short, like how, how is short-term money acting versus kind of like the long-term holders? Right. And, and it gives you a sense of, okay, once these larger, because the thing about it is like, it doesn't guarantee that somebody is, um, is a better investor or smarter just because they've been in the market longer. But what mm-hmm. it does, uh, what it does do is it gives you a lo- longer time to educate yourself on the cycles. You're more experienced. So, so naturally by having more experience of being in the market, um, you're more likely to sell at the right times just because you're more familiar with the cycles and how Bitcoin works in general. And then right. also by being in the market longer, you've had more chance, yeah, like I said, to educate yourself. And so for many reasons, um, the older wallets, their, their activity tends to indicate better. It, it correlates better with, uh, with cycles, whereas the short-term uh, wallets and the short-term money, when they sell and buy, like it's, it's uh, usually at the wrong times, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of times. And we, we just saw this like, confirmed mm. completely on this last downturn we had a lot of three to actually a lot of the wallets that were selling and a lot of the money that was selling um that on this last drop was actually wallets that were three or, or bitcoin that were three to six months old mm. um, so it, was, it wasn't we actually didn't see a lot of selling for the one year plus um very little selling for the one year plus so that kind of shows me that there's they're still waiting for the next leg up in the cycle yeah. It yeah. kind of gives you an indication that a lot of the older uh, holders they're hodling, they're 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 not convinced this is the end of the cycle, and because of that, <clears throat> they help to set a floor on the price to in a way mm. or the one aspect of what sets a floor because they're just refusing to sell. They 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 believe that there's more upside coming, and mm. um, so there you can see that you can really see that by looking at these wallets and how long they've held for. So that's mm. one way of looking at it, and and so for me. Um, if you look at the drawdown in, in the one year plus HODL wave, which is one of the most useful ways of looking at this, it's actually only dropped, um, relatively speaking, about 50% of what it usually drops during a, a full bar, a market cycle mm. compared to the previous three cycles. So, uh, or the, yeah, the previous two, main, mainly the last two. So that's one indicator, right? You never want to look at one thing. You want to look at a lot. Uh, to determine right. what to do. But that to me was a strong indication that the older wallets um, and the smarter money, you could say more experienced, I, I call them um, more experienced market participants, is essentially mm. a way of looking at it. Mm. They, they're not, they're not, they didn't sell. And so um, the other, the other aspect to go into is usually at a, a cycle peak, you see a, a drop off in um, uh, it's called, so there's, there's, uh, there's new wallets that are being created and there's also new entities on chain. Now an entity, uh, the definition of an entity with Glassnode is um, say, say someone has 10 wallets and then they move all those wallets to a single wallet at a certain point. Say they have a bunch of different wallets and they kind of condense them into one wallet. Um, what that would be doing is that would be mm-hmm. taking um, 10 entities and co- condensing it into one entity. Um, mm-hmm. before, on chain before, when you look at the data, you don't know that those wallets are connected because they haven't done any activity in the past that would connect them. But once wallets get connected, once you have like, I'm not sure, like if you just think about your activity within crypto, I mean, there's probably been times where you've held money in various places. Then at times you've, you've kind of condensed those holdings into a a certain place. Like, so on chain, they, they assess all this and they see like, okay, once people combine their coins, they can kind of narrow in. And because a lot of people wonder like how many people are actually in crypto because a lot of people have multiple wallets, mm-hmm. um, but it, it comes down to clustering. It comes down to identifying like wallet activity and, and how you can kind of narrow in on, on more what's called entities. So it's a more, it's a closer way of looking at like how many people are actually in the market. Mm-hmm. So when you look at the, the net entity growth, if you look at people leaving the market, like when, when someone empties out all their wallets or when some, someone empties out their, their singular wallet or whatever, then that's an entity being destroyed on chain. And so that's someone leaving the market, essentially. Um, but what we're seeing right now, what we've seen over the last month is we've actually seen uh, the net entity growth on chain hitting an all-time high. So what that what is basically on a, a larger scale showing you, you is that there's enough new money coming in and enough new interest and enough adoption at this point in the cycle to support the price. So if, if we had a, a decrease of interest or a decrease of these entities growing, uh, a decrease of the essentially money flow into crypto. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, like, like I said before, so the, the, main, the main overview way to say it is old money hasn't sold. They're, they're, for the most part, they're hodling through this, uh, this downturn. You have still enough new entries coming in to support the price levels because usually a, a market cycle peak 
uh, one of the main determining factors is you don't have enough new money coming in to support the price. So the price will drop because it's not necessarily about a lot of people selling. I mean, that's a factor, but it's also just not, not a lot of new money willing to buy that price level. Right. So, so what we're seeing is we have a lot of new money willing to buy this, this price level. And so that supports the price. So you have new money coming in, you have a hitting an all time high, essentially and new entries on chain. You have old money, not selling old, old uh, wallets, not selling. And then on top of that, um, mm. you have now, uh, uh, you're starting to see outflows from the exchanges. You're actually starting to see the, the the Bitcoin on the exchanges starting to, it just flipped actually recently to actually starting to decrease the amount of Bitcoin on, on chain. Um, so, mm. or on the exchanges, I should say. So yeah, there, there's many other factors and, and many other ways of looking at it. But um, yeah, uh, the last thing I'll mention on this topic is uh, stable coins. So one of the another reason why I, I was very confident that this wasn't the end of the market cycle was because we actually hit an all time high for stable coins on exchange. So if this was the end of the cycle, right. um, you know, you, you could see a lot of that that money that um, was sold uh, from Bitcoin being taken into uh, maybe dollars or just or just I don't know, like it just would if it was like so stable coins on exchange versus stable coins on Celsius, a little bit of a difference there, right? Because Celsius. Right. You know, these are people that are just happy to be in stable coins. They're not looking to get maybe back into a Bitcoin position. Mm. But it, on average, you could say that stable coins on exchanges indicates the, that money's on the sideline waiting to jump back in. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's that's one way of looking at it is we saw a growth. We, we saw the, the drop of the Bitcoin price, but we uh, but we saw an equal rise of the stable coins on exchanges. And we hit an all time high with that. And so mm. to me, that's like a lot. A lot of money was waiting on the sidelines, ready to get back into the market. Mm -hmm. um, so those are kind of the main, the, some of the main things, right? Like uh, that I got, just went through there. So um, yeah, a lot of new okay. entries coming in, a lot of money on the sidelines, a lot of older wallets not selling um, and just, and then supply shock. We had like, we're having, we're continually having um, Bitcoin taken off these exchanges and put into older wallets that don't have a history of selling and, and accumulating. So um, yeah. I just look at this as a mid cycle uh, pause yeah. in, the, in the cycle and, um, as far as drivers, um, maybe, maybe, I don't know, I should let you talk some more. I'm just rambling again. Um, is there any other specific questions? Like, um, I no, know, I think uh, uh, not financial advice, of course, but anyone who's considering to sell out and tired of crypto, not going anywhere, you know, hold tight because, uh, a next wave might be coming. And speaking of, uh, Celsius and, uh, of course the founder and CEO, Alex Mashinsky, who has been pretty spot on with his, um, with his predictions, uh, I think last year he predicted the price of Bitcoin hitting all-time high or something with uh, one day difference, something crazy. He was almost spot on. Uh, and he said uh, this year in 2021 that the next all-time high, or we will see, I think he was. He said, we will see Bitcoin hit uh, 100K uh, in this market cycle uh, in 2021. Do you agree with that? Do you think there's going to be a higher all-time high? What What's your take on the on the Bitcoin price coming up? Yeah, for sure. Like, I definitely think that, that like I said, the cycle's far from over. I, I could see us making an all-time high for sure this year. Um, you know, no one knows for sure, but but um, there are some some drivers of the price uh, to the upside that I could see happening. So it really yeah. depends on on different factors. But yeah, with Alex Machinsky's prediction, I mean, he's uh, he said publicly for quite a while, like he's, he thinks the end of this year, or he said at some point this year, we'll hit between 140 and 160,000. Mm -hmm. And then he sees us finishing the year between 80 and 90,000. So coming back down, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, for myself, like um, it really depends if we get a Bitcoin ETF this year. Um, this is something I've been really tracking as far as like headlines. It's, it's one of the few things as far as headlines that I'm actually looking at is, is what's, what's the, well, a lot of people are looking at the, um, the fear related headlines I'm focused on. Okay. What are people doing in the background? Like what is the, mm. how are people positioning themselves? And, and I've seen some, some headlines recently that are super bullish. Like, I mean, we have 13, as far as I'm aware, last time I checked, there was 13 applications in from major mm. players, right? Fidelity, you know, they had the wink, uh, the Gemini twins, like right. you've got some huge, Winkle you have, yeah. Mike, have, you have Mike Novogratz has one in, you have mm. the, um, Grayscale has partnered now with BNY Mellon, who has a good uh, a good track record of working with ETFs and, and good connections, of course, being an old older bank and one of the largest. So you you have these a lot of players position themselves, and you have, mm -hmm. you know, 
13 of these ETFs that are uh, pending applications. So uh, it just seems inevitable that we're going to get an ETF either at the end of this year or early next year. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of this regulation and a lot of these headlines as of late um, is actually a, um, related to this. It's related to, you know, if they do want to get an ETF going, if they do want to launch one, because there's a lot of pressure for them to do so, and there's a lot of a pent up demand for an ETF, hmm. you know, it, they, they need to, uh, to, I guess, in quote unquote, clean up the space or, or uh, make some regulatory moves. So that's, I think, a big part of the thing we're seeing with like the over leverage um, on like right. a Binance or, or these different different uh, places that platforms that allow for just really unnecessary amounts of leverage, like 100x yeah. doesn't seem really necessary. Um, you know, keep it under 20 X or keep it whatever, under whatever X, like keep it more reasonable. So they're, they're starting to crack down on, on things yeah. and making sure like, okay, know your customer, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, and then on top of that, we're seeing, yeah, we're just seeing a lot of headlines with regulation. So I think that's them preparing for an ETF launch. Um, Mike Novogratz is, who's one of the people that has an ETF in, he actually says, I, I listened to a recent interview with him and he said, end of this year, he thinks an ETF will launch. Mm -hmm. I've heard on Alex Mashinsky say the same thing on a lot of uh, uh, streams that he thinks it could happen into this year uh, or early next year. So mm -hmm. to me, that's one of the big, the big drivers for this market cycle. Um, and I don't think the cycle is over until we get an ETF right. um, because they've denied this ETF for so long. And it's got to a point where there's even headlines and, and people involved in, in, in this that have said like it's overdue, like it should have happened a long time ago. So right. Um, they need to clean up some of the manipulation on the weekends in the market and just a different, some different mm. things um, before this launches, but it's, it's coming. And we've already seen a launch in Canada. We've already seen a launch in a, a few other countries. In Canada, there was a billion dollars. As far as I remember, there was a billion dollars in the first few weeks that came into that uh, ETF. Wow. And uh, I listened to another podcast where these guys had been doing ETFs for like 30 years. And they said, typically what they see in the financial markets is uh, Canadian ETFs typically are uh, about 50 times smaller than the U.S., and so, you know, going based on that, you know, mm. we could see uh, wow. a crazy, crazy demand. Like we could, we could see upwards of, well, I mean, it, it seems like a, a lot, a lot to say, but 50 billion mm. uh, dollars of demand. So wow. um, ETF's a unique vehicle that a lot of the traditional uh, system is comfortable with. Um, yeah. And so I think it's going to allow a lot more people to, to get into Bitcoin. And I think it could be one of the, the most significant drivers of this cycle. Mm. Um so yeah, that's one thing I'm looking at for sure is, is when is this ETF going to go? I think it's going to mostly be, um, my prediction uh, anyways with that is it's Grayscale that, that gets it because they, they partner with BNY and they, they have the placeholder um, uh, already kind of ETF they're, they've been doing. So, um, and they're highly incentivized to, to get that ETF going because there's this discount on BTC and, and everything that's mm -hmm. going on. They want to probably right. get that, um, that to zero. So right. yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a huge factor. Um, so I don't know as far as price predictions, like for me, it's, it's more about um, kind of watching and seeing where things go. And, and as, as time gets closer, um, you know, it'll be easier to determine, determine kind of like what levels we'll get to. But yeah, I would say myself, like I'm, I'm probably say, I probably, I would probably say that between hundred and 180,000 uh, oh. for Bitcoin in this cycle is, is conservatively, I would say that's going to happen um, at some point. Like my, my, um, Depending on when the ETF goes, um, that's going to be a factor. But I, I would say, I also believe myself personally uh, in, in somewhat in lengthening cycle theory. So I, I would say that um, I think the cycle is going to go well into next year. That's kind of how I'm seeing things. And some of the metrics mm -hmm. are showing that, that we could actually see the cycle peak um, really next year. And, and a lot of people think it could happen at the end of this year, but I'm actually... I would say that, um, yeah, next year and even into the second half of next year is, is definitely, oh. I would say, po I would say possible. So yeah. every cycle, there's kind of something that surprises, surprises us in a way. And, and this cycle, it could be that the cycle is a lot longer than people expect. Um, and it gets kind of drawn out with, cause it, it's, this cycle is more about the institutional adoption. Yes. Um, I would say, and, and like the last cycle was, you know, more to do with the ICO boom cycle before was just like complete speculation from retail. So this one is a little bit more of like an actual adoption and, and institution and big money coming in. It takes them longer to get in the cycle. Like it's, it's a lot harder for them to get in versus a retail person that can just go and buy on exchange, like institutional yeah. money. You know, we had the um, Michael Saylor uh, summit at the beginning of this year in February, and mm -hmm. there was a lot of, uh, of, of significant uh, players that came to that summit. Yeah. And they, uh, they need time to get in the market. It can take them three, three to 12 months to get in. And so, 
I think we'll see more of an influx of that coming in. Um, we also will see headlines. I think we'll see a lot of headlines of major uh, uh, S&P 500 companies that are putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet. You know, we saw this recent thing with Amazon, um, which is another, you know, another driver. So yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see, but I personally think like we're, we're not even close to the end of the cycle. And um, with the supply that we have with Bitcoin, like we can see huge moves to the upside. Um, and, and I don't see a reason why like uh, Alex Bashinsky's prediction is, is possible. And, and yeah, like, I think we'll, we'll see some movements in the cycle and the price can move quickly. And, and yeah. we'll see, I think we'll see for sure over hundred K. And yeah. I think, um, yeah, next year, well into next year, we could see this, the cycle peak. That's kind of how I'm looking at it. And that's, um, I mean, on the face of it, when you hear Bitcoin hitting a hundred K, it sounds so crazy, but taking all these factors into account that you just outlined, it seems totally possible. Um, you talked about supply shock uh, and institutions coming in with big money. It might take longer times, but when they start to adopt crypto, which they are doing, it um, it can go completely wild. And that's actually, you know, institutions coming in late, relatively speaking, to retail investors. That's actually in my view, at least, uh, one of the beauties of crypto for, for the first time, I don't know if it's in history, but for the first time in a very long time, retail investors or everyday people have a chance to get in before VCs, institutional investors, you know, smart money, quote unquote. Um, that's quite unique, I think. I, I don't think we've seen that uh, many times in history where the average Joe really could set up an account and move faster than institutions and get you know, into the market, uh, reaping the benefits of being early uh, compared to institutions. But I want to touch upon, you mentioned supply shock, you mentioned uh, Mike Novogratz a few times, which obviously leads me to the whole discussion on Ethereum versus Bitcoin. We tend to focus a lot on Bitcoin when we talk about the bull market, uh, what's the new all-time high and all that stuff. It's all with the Bitcoin lens, but uh, arguably, we uh, we will see we will start to see uh, the uh, Ethereum or ETH uh, protocol start flipping. Uh, people talk about the flipping of ha happening between uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin. Do you think that will happen? Will that happen in this market cycle? If not, uh, will it ever happen? What what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's an interesting topic for sure uh, to discuss. Like it's. Um... It, it would it would change a lot of the like you said the lens that uh, that we look at crypto through or the cycles through because Bitcoin has been you know the top dog for so long mm -hmm. um, it's so tied to the cycles like and, and it, it'd be interesting like if we do see at some point an Ethereum flip Bitcoin how that would affect the um, kind of the overall cycle and and everything but yeah I personally would say um, for sure it's possible it, it's definitely something that's possible I mean. Market cap wise, there's still a, a sizable gap between them, but it's it's not like a, a crazy gap at this point. Uh, we saw we saw Ethereum have a huge run up to four thousand there, like that was a very fast move mm, uh, for Ethereum. The the one thing uh, worth noting about Ethereum is you actually had the Ethereum Foundation. A lot of people don't know this, but they uh, my understanding is they dumped a huge percentage of coins uh, actually at the top. Um, so they mm. did they did uh, and actually they, I believe they did the same thing in 2017 is they actually dumped a significant amount of Ethereum near the top. So um, yeah, I mean, they can pushing down the price, basically pushing well, down the price. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just they see a crazy move and it's an opportunity for them to, to take some profits themselves. Right. I mean, they're a, they're an entity that I can sound like they sold their whole position, but they, they did sell a, a meaningful amount. Um, right. Which which is good. I mean, in, in some ways, it, it gives them a lot of money to continue to expand the project. But um, yeah, it's worth noting that you have like, a I guess, with Ethereum, you have a foundation that is has the most insights, I guess you could say on, on the price and, and, and the project. And, and when they see a huge move up, they, they have a, lo a lot of Ethereum they can sell. Um, right. Whereas you don't really have that. I mean, Bitcoin, you have that in other ways, but it's just a little different. Right. Um, so what I, what I would say with the flipping though is um, yeah, I, I would say, I mean, it's just my thoughts. Like it doesn't, it's just my one, one person's opinion, but I would say I, we don't see a flipping this cycle in my opinion. Um, there's a possibility at some point in the cycle we get close to it. I, the EIP 1559 uh, is coming mm -hmm. out pretty quick here, and it's hard to say like exactly how that's going to impact the um, the supply mm -hmm. of Ethereum and how, and how that's going to reflect in the price movements. Um, you know, we could see that. We, we I'll, I'll say a few things with Ethereum. So I look at the on-chain data for Ethereum as well. Uh, I, I do hold Ethereum and I do follow it. Um, so 
we saw a 100% increase in the amount of Ethereum um, that, have, that are locked up in uh, smart contracts over the last year. So mm. it's, it was exactly 100%. Like we, we saw uh, it was around 4, 4.5% all the way up to 25%, roughly speaking, um, of the whole Ethereum circulating supply was locked up in, not locked up, but in smart contracts. So in some way being used in the network um, in a way that it, it may, may uh, cause it to less likely be put back in a circulating supply. So we're seeing adoption. We're seeing a lot of things on that front with Ethereum. Um, we're seeing a lot of Ethereum right now actually being locked up into um, the EIP-1559 or the, oh, sorry, a lot of uh, ETH2, I should say. A lot Staking, of, uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. A lot of validators. Yeah. So there's a huge amount of validators. I think 160,000 validators last time I checked uh, was mm -hmm. showing. Yeah. And, the, and, each, and to be a validator, you need to have 32 ETH, right? So you can work out the math on that. I, I did, I have some, yeah, I, I worked out the math. It was, uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but the amount of percent, but it was a meaningful percent mm. that are locked up in those. Um, they can't, they can't be taken out. Like the, they literally exactly. can't be moved. They, they're getting the, they're getting the high uh, staking yield. Um, yeah. They've, they've committed to like, but they're waiting for ETH2 to launch. So there's, there's a percentage of the supply, a meaningful percent that's locked up in these validator contracts, mm. over 160,000 of them. And then you have the uh, increasing amount going to smart contracts. And then you have the EIP 1559 coming out. Um, so you have a lot of factors also to do with the supply shock with for ETH. So you, you could make a very strong case for Bitcoin and ETH that there's different reasons why there'll be these supply shocks. True. And so that's why like, yeah, flipping is in the cards because um, with any kind of a supply shock, you can see crazy movements in the price. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, I, I would still say my prediction for this cycle is we don't see it. Um, I think next cycle, it's definitely possible. It does depend though on, I'll say this, if ETH ends up being the, the hundred percent dominant long-term uh, platform, I think it will flip Bitcoin at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's guaranteed yet. That, big, that Ethereum will be the, the winner of this category. I think that it's they're the highest probability probably because of network effects and because mm -hmm. of adoption. Right. Um, at this point, I would say they are the leader and they are the most likely um, candidate to win this category of Web3. But there mm -hmm. are some, there are some um, again, like meaningful players that are, that are coming up. Um, I would say like a Polkadot and a Solana uh, mm -hmm. the, the two main ones that I'm looking at, other people would say Cardano as well, but I'm looking at right. mainly Solana and Polkadot um, for different reasons. Those two uh, could potentially take take some of the shine of Ethereum, um, mm -hmm. which could reduce the likelihood of a flippening. So if if, a the, if ETH just continues to dominate this category and, and all these up and comers, like the thing about the Web3 and the platform is there's so many players in this category. There's so much mm. competition compared yeah. to Bitcoin, which really doesn't have any competition. Um, it might ultimately be a category that has a lower market cap as a category. Um, and there might be like less, uh, I guess, money in this theme of, of, of store value versus like the, you know, the economy of a value that gets, yeah, it's like the, the web three is, um, is a huge deal, like whatever platform wins this, but there could be multiple winners and that, and that could cause like a, a dilution of the, of, of the ultimate winner, right? We're already seeing that. We're already seeing like, I mean, if it wasn't for Polkadot, Solana, Cardano, and like mm. a bunch of other players, if there was just ETH in this category, I mean, it's market mm. cap would be a lot higher. Yeah. Um, and it would yeah. actually be, you could, you could add them up and it would be, you know, probably getting pretty close to Bitcoin already. So exactly. the long, long answer to your question, sorry, I, I tend to, have long answers but um yeah it's uh i would say i don't see if flipping happening this cycle mm -hmm. i definitely see a possibility in the future depending on how the platform wars you could say play out mm -hmm. um and if uh, eth can kind of stay uh, on the, on top because um there are some are some significant uh up and comers i would say mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what's I your think... opinion what, what do you what do you think about the flipping like what's your what's your take yeah on? so full disclosure i'm uh i'm super big on uh, ethereum i think they are they're doing a fantastic job uh, building along the way. Uh, they people criticize Ethereum for you know launching something and then fixing it on the way, but I I really prefer that also coming from a pro programming perspective. I've built so many different projects and platforms and iterating along the way is just the winning strategy if you ask me. And that's what Ethereum has taken compared to, for example, Cardano, who wants the perfect solution from an academic standpoint and all these different papers and all that stuff before they launch anything. And uh, the big question for me, though, in terms of Ethereum, whether that will win compared to other 
smart contracts platforms is whether these, so first of all, the upgrades to Ethereum, will they continue to be postponed, which they have in the past for sure. EIP 1559 is coming up. How will that affect uh, the price of Ethereum? A big joker here is all the different layer two or optimistic rollups, CK rollup uh, kind of implementations. Polygon is a, um, it's a project that I invested in also and uh, has been exploding like crazy. Um, so yeah, my take is that I'm a fan of Ethereum. I still hold uh, Polkadot. Uh, I have a little bit of Solana. I have a little bit of Cardano just to hedge, you know, just in case that that will explode and overtake Ethereum. But I am pretty big on Ethereum. That's my main bet. And just looking on the market cap, that's sort of a simple analysis people can do when you look at, you know, where are people building stuff? I mean, looking at, at the coin market cap in the top, let's say 20 coins, you have Ethereum number two. I'm looking at it right now. Ethereum number two, Tether, which is which is an ERC20 token, is, uh, is number three. Binance coin is number four, which is also an ERC20 token. Um, you have USDC that we talked about, number eight. You have Uniswap, the biggest DEX in the world, number 11, or the Uni token. You have Polygon that I just mentioned, or Matic, as they call it, number 17. So when I just look at, you know, comparing it to Cardano, Solana, etc., cetera, uh, Ethereum just seems to be this, have a way, uh, be way ahead of the other projects. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, in tech, you know, things change very fast, especially in crypto and blockchain. That doesn't mean that uh, Polkadot can launch and overtake Ethereum. I think Polkadot personally, that is the strongest contender to um, to Ethereum. But Polkadot to me is a little bit like Ethereum was in 2017. It's a, it's a bet. Uh, it could go completely wild and it could go nowhere, like EOS, which we also talked about off air. Um, so I would... I would uh, my personal um, portfolio has a little bit of polka dot and if people are you know in between what they don't think ethereum is going to overtake everyone polka dot might be a smart move to hold a little uh, portion of yeah i think that's a smart smart take because like um yeah like when i i have a quite a bit of like yeah your background definitely um makes you a the probably one of the, like your, your background helps you to understand like this this sort of mm -hmm. a category of investing for sure and mm -hmm. like you said like just seeing the difference between uh, iterating as you go and just um yeah just basically taking forever to launch anything and, and trying mm -hmm. to perfect everything like it's a big it's a big difference and um exactly like Ethereum is by far the leader and, and does have the adoption and does have like all the, the major projects building on it uh, at this point. Um, so right. yeah, it, it's a clear leader. It's just, yeah, like we're, I guess, I guess one thing I'll say is, um, you know, I was in 2017 cycle, we had a lot of these quote unquote ETH killers coming up, right? We had like, it's funny to think back because at the time these were all a big deal. You had EOS, <laughs> you had NEO, yeah. you had ICON, you had a yeah. uh, uh, quotum or something. There's, there's like a, a, a ton. There's so many different ones, right? Mm. People were talking, they all had their turn of being in the spotlight. And, um, and in the end, none of them amounted to really that much of anything. Like if you look at all the, you can even go back to 2017 and you can look at the historical rankings of coin market cap. It's actually not a bad activity to do every once in a while to kind of remind, remind, uh, remind yourself like, that stuff can be in the spotlight one minute and be gone the next and what really sticks around throughout the cycle. So last cycle, okay. we had a half a dozen or a dozen like quote, quote unquote ETH killers. And all of those coins are, all of them are lower ranked today than they were during that cycle. So like we had a whole, what I'm trying to say is we had like a, a class of, of smart contracts that were competing with ETH that came in that cycle and they all died off and they all lost compared to ETH. Now we have a, the, a next, the next wave or the second class are the newer class of ETH killers coming. And they might be of better quality and there might be more substance behind them, but we could mm -hmm. actually see the same thing happen. We could literally see this cycle, a, 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 a kind of a rise up like we saw with these other platforms and then mm -hmm. the fall as they don't, as ETH launches its, its stuff and it just doesn't. So it's really hard to say, um, but I would say like history so far has showed that there's always been a lot of competitors to ETH, but none have really actually stood the test of time as of yet. Um, I do think this crop of competitors is, is a lot of higher caliber, but we could see the same result. Um, so one thing I'll say with Solana is, you know, we, there was a recent uh, $900 million raise uh, with FTX. 
Mm. And um, there are that project is very connected to Solana. And so true. You know, it, it's money. Money does not guarantee success by any means. I saw, we saw that with EOS, like EOS yes. raised $5 billion, largest <laughs> ICO of all time. Um, by far, they did a year long ICO. And I mean, that project had amounted to really nothing. Um, yeah. I do think the Solana is, uh, is actually trying to do stuff. Whereas EOS, I have no idea what that project was trying to do. Like they really put, they put all their, all their, uh, money really into bitcoin <laughs> like they mm-hmm. just they basically pocketed their ico money just bought bitcoin yeah. but um but yeah i would say the 900 million dollar raise uh, as of recent like that that headline when i saw that that kind of gave me two two things to think about one is okay um you know you have uh, ftx raise that that kind of money they're mm-hmm. going to be a major player in the space for sure they got they raised that 18 billion dollars um which was a which is a good amount of, uh, for a raise and they uh at 18 billion dollar valuation um they to me, that headline was was meaningful because it made me feel like, okay, there's a lot of regulation headlines coming out right now, but then you have a company that just raised $900 million. Yeah. Uh, so that means $900 million worth of capital just came into crypto. So if crypto was going to disappear, if crypto was going to be regulated to, a, to oblivion and it was just going to become nothing, like you just got to look at the capital flows from the mm. traditional financial system. And some of these huge players and these huge head funds and these, these large uh, angel investors or whatever, like they're putting tons of money into the space ongoing still, um, yeah. regardless of what the price is doing, regardless of what the headlines are, regardless of what the regulation headlines are saying. So to me, that's confidence that um, the amount of money being invested in this space, like it's definitely not going anywhere from my mm-hmm. perspective. And, um, but also that made me think, okay, Solana is kind of connected to that project somewhat with the, with the founder and things. So, you know, it could, it could be something in the future with Solana up and coming, but, um, For sure. but yeah, we don't, we, it doesn't, it doesn't guarantee anything. It really doesn't. No, no. And I mean, the difference between Solana in my perspective and EOS is that things are actually being built on Solana, uh, which is a big difference also in crypto in general uh, today compared to 2017. Uh, but I, I tend to, uh, maybe that's also because of my background, but I really tend to focus on where are people building things? Because if people don't build with anything, they might have raised an ungodly amount of money. But if people are interested in, interested in adopting it, then there's no point, right? EOS is the, probably the best example of that. Yeah, it's it, you definitely want to want to like you said, follow the adoption, follow the the growth mm-hmm. of actual like wh- where are the developers going, where's the mind share going, where are things actually being built, like you said. So, yeah, time will tell if any of these other projects can uh, compete. Um, we could see a world in which we have multiple winners, where you have like a polka dot you know, being the um, interoperable kind of winner mm-hmm. of, of, of that category. And, mm-hmm. and potentially you have like a Solana being like used for certain aspects of the, the like say they have a, a lot higher uh, throughput, you know, they could be, there could be, they could have a small niche of, of certain, certain projects that launch on, on Solana that need like extremely uh, high throughput, but you still could have like the majority being built on Ethereum for the security and for the network effects of that ecosystem. So we could see a world in where you have, you know, Polkadot, Solana and, and ETH, um, you know, multiple winners and, and kind of all having their own part of the pie. But um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I only hold ETH. I don't hold Polkadot or Solana myself, but um mm-hmm. But I definitely am watching those too, and and um, kind of got sure. my, they're on my watch list. You could say as far as uh, yeah, looking at those ones. But yeah, yeah, and that's I mean the big joker here is that this market is moving so fast and it's expanding so fast. So while Ethereum right now is sort of pioneering the DeFi and and uh, yeah DeFi revolution and all these different things with and NFTs and, and all that, I mean Solana might be carving out a niche within that or a whole different market that we don't know about today which they will specialize in. I know, for example, uh, Polygon or Matic, uh, which has built on top of Ethereum, but they are very sort of big on the NFT space. Um, And there could be a niche for that for Solana, for Polkadot or whatever, right? So it's super hard to predict, uh, especially with the market moving so fast. I mean, this is all about infrastructure. You know, more and more applications are being, being built as decentralized applications or dApps. And it's very unpredictable which new uh, DAP is going to be a killer app, right? It might be a social network. It might be a Uber kind of marketplace. It's just so difficult to say. And depending on which one comes first, there might be a protocol that is not Ethereum, which is perfectly suited for that. So that's, I guess, the big jover that we that nobody knows about. And that's kind of the fun about this, uh, if you ask me. 
But we are way over time, Plan C. I, I want to thank you so much for uh, dropping all your knowledge upon us. There's a lot to digest. So uh, something that I always like to ask is where can people find you? Where are you communicating all your thoughts? So if, you, if people want to want to learn more or just follow you and your daily thoughts. Yeah, for sure. Uh, definitely. Um, yeah, on Twitter, at, um, Plan C uh, Deep Dive or at Plan C Deep Dive on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other, the other thing you, uh, the other way you can follow me is, um, I have a, a project I'm working on with, um, with Kevin. I think, I think Kevin was just on your, your, your show as well. Um, yeah, yep. but Kevin, uh, um, Kevin started, uh, Kevin and a group of guys, we've started the, um, yield labs project and, uh, we're doing biweekly calls. We actually just had one yesterday, our first, uh, our first call, and it's a free call that anyone can join. It's open to, um, everyone. It's a inclusive community. Uh, it's something that we're looking to grow and, and um, yeah, we think there's, there's a lot of value with that just to uh, just have a panelist of, of people that are more experienced in crypto and, and give an opportunity to do different presentations on provi providing data and just being very um, unbiased with our approach, like trying to give, like we're focused on yield space. Like, so we're focused on like the open finance, the DeFi, the CFI kind of generating yield. Like that's the primary theme of the, of the project, but we, um, we will be sharing also about market cycles. I'll be sharing my data too with market cycles. And so we, we're uh, currently what, how you can be involved with that is just, um, we have a telegram group. Um, you can follow the YouTube channel. It's Yield Labs uh, on YouTube. So I, have a, I also have a YouTube channel uh, just called Plan C Deep Dive that I'm just starting. Um, so I'll be putting half my videos on Yield, uh, Yield Labs YouTube and half on the Plan C uh, Deep Dive YouTube. But um, yeah, if you follow the, the YouTubes and you, and you get in our Telegram group, then uh, every, every other Sunday, um, we'll be doing usually like around a three hour call, first two hours of just presentations from different panelists. Um, and then we'll, uh, we will, uh, the last, uh, usually the last hour or so we do Q and A and unrecorded section. So you can see previous uh, recorded sections on YouTube. Um, and then you can kind of, if you decide to, to listen live, you'll be able to ask questions directly and, and kind of get more of our off the cuff, like uh, responses when we stop streaming or stop recording. So yeah, that's, those are the main projects I'm involved with. Um, I do post live about Celsius still, and I am involved with that community. Um, but I am, I am also, um, my main project right now is with Yield Labs and, and really trying to look at like all the opportunities related to the kind of uh, yield, uh, um, yield space, I guess you could say or open finance space. So yeah, that's kind of my nice. uh, main places you can, you can find me. Nice. And I'll make sure to link to everything below. If people are curious to join Telegram, uh, follow you on YouTube, Twitter, etc. cetera. So, uh, so people can follow you. But Plan C, thank you so much for being part of the community, sharing your knowledge. I know it's a lifesaver even for a lot of people out there uh, getting into crypto. So uh, thank you so much, my friend, and uh, stay safe wherever you are. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me on, Mark. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot.